Okay, everyone stand by. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jeffrey Smith, and I'm your co-host for today's show, in which we will debate the role of America in Africa. This has been an important issue for decades, of course, but it's especially topical in light of next month's U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, when President Joe Biden will convene dozens of African heads of state in Washington, D.C., to discuss the future of these longstanding and often complicated relationships. We will ask if it's time for the U.S. to stand back and essentially mind its own business when it comes to Africa. Or, on the other hand, should the world's most powerful democracy, despite its many shortcomings and democratic backsliding, engage in a more substantive way to match its often lofty rhetoric on democracy and human rights with concrete action? Helping me to guide today's conversation, as always, is my colleague, Mentate Mloshua. Hey, Mentate, how are you doing today? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Fantastic. I, I'm so happy that you're joining us today, along with all of our all of our guests and just a way is refreshing everyone's memory who's tuning in today. The Resistance Bureau focuses on the major threats to human rights and freedom in Africa, as well as worldwide, while shining a light on the enduring struggles for freedom. The show features the leaders at the forefront of these fights and we seek to build solidarity and networks among them. It is in this spirit that we are joined by today's stellar panel. First, we have with us Bobby Wine, a good friend who appeared on our very first show back in 2020 and someone who I'm sure is familiar to most of our viewers. Bobby is an award-winning musician, artist, and political leader from Uganda whose struggle against dictatorship is well known, including being featured in a podcast called The Messenger and a recent documentary, The Ghetto President. In recent years, he has emerged as a prolific orator and writer, being included by Foreign Policy Magazine, for example, as among the world's top global thinkers. We are also joined by Ka Wala, who is president of the Cameroon People's Party and was the first woman in the country's history to contest the presidency. She has been recognized by Newsweek magazine as among the 150 women who move the world. And despite having endured multiple arrests and even a kidnapping in Cameroon, she continues to be an outspoken and courageous defender of human rights and an advocate for the marginalized. Next, we have Zachariah Mampili, a highly respected political scientist and the author of numerous academic articles, think pieces, chapters, and books, including one of my personal favorites from recent years, Africa Uprising, Popular Protest and Political Change. Zachariah currently teaches at Baruch College and is a member of the doctoral faculty in the Department of Political Science at City University of New York. Our discussant today, who will be joining us a bit later on, is Lizzie Shackelford, a senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She is a former U.S. diplomat who resigned in protest in 2017 while stationed in South Sudan to call attention to the declining state of diplomacy and the lack of action on human rights during the Trump administration. In 2020, she wrote about her experiences in a book, The Descent Channel, American Diplomacy in a Dishonest Age, another one of my recent favorites. For our listeners, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Resist Bureau and use the hashtag Resist Bureau Live for today's show. Right now, we are live streaming on Facebook and on YouTube, as well as recording the show for later distribution. So before we turn to today's panel, I want to hand this over to my co-host, Mentade, so she can set the scene for today's discussion. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jeff. You know, when we speak about the relationship between the U.S. and Africa, it's very important that we reflect on the individual parts that both Africa and the U.S. have been on and how that informs the nature of the relationship that exists between the two today. Colonial history serves as a point of caution for how the African continent perceives the intentions of the U.S. In today's Africa, there is a geopolitical reality of rivalry among superpowers who are competing for influence. Successive American administrations have spoken about resisting Chinese and Russian influence in Africa, seeming to view and treat the continent as a pawn and not a genuine partner. In 2050, not only will Africa make up 25% of the global population, but it will still be in a greater measure the youngest continent in the world. Now more than ever, the U.S. must honor Africa as a strategic partner and not a prize to win. Today's discussion is centering around how the development of the U.S.-Africa relation can best prioritize what Africans actually want, hopefully providing the consistency that changing administrations in Washington cannot guarantee. This conversation is especially timely because 
Millions of Americans are voting today, right now in an election that may fundamentally change the way the US conducts its foreign policy. I could go on, but I will leave my reflections here so that we can join our guests to this conversation. As the audience, you can share your reflections through our YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook comment sections and send us your questions via WhatsApp on the number plus 263-776-238-199. The number is also available on the screen right now in case you missed it. Jeff, I'll hand it over to you to bring in today's speakers. Thanks so much, Mentari, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, Bobby, I would love to start with you to kickstart today's show. Unfortunately, uh, I have to pose a difficult question to you because, uh, as you are aware, we are 10 days from uh, the two-year anniversary of a massacre in Uganda when regime operatives uh, reportedly, on the orders of President Museveni himself, shot and killed over 150 of your fellow citizens in broad daylight. And despite these horrific crimes, committed with absolute impunity, the US has remained one of Museveni's biggest diplomatic and financial backers. So in light of this reality, which has been you know, ongoing for decades, how do you assess the role of the US in Uganda? Is it helpful or does it only worsen a situation seen by many Ugandans, by millions of Ugandans as wholly intolerable? Would love your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, and greetings to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here. Although I'm introduced as Bobby Wine, which I appreciate. Bobby Wine is just a nickname that is unfortunately overtaking my real name. My name is Chagulani Sentamu Mitembo, and uh, I lead the National Unity Platform Party, but I like to also introduce myself as an artist and a common Ugandan. Um, first of all, I want to appreciate the collaboration of the United States with Uganda because, I mean, it identifies us as a state uh, that is worth associating with. However, the collaboration comes uh, largely to the detriment of the people of Uganda, uh, well knowing that uh, the fact is that Uganda uh, has been under the military dictatorship of General Yoweri Museveni for the last 36 years. Uh, for the last 36 years, Uganda has seen gross human rights abuses. Today, as we speak, uh, abductions are the order of the day, and this is open. Um, torture is the order of the day, and this is uh, open. The regime does not hide it anymore. Unfortunately, uh, even though we, every once in a while, we get strong statements from the United States, those statements have become more or less cliche. The United States um, supports the Uganda military with approximately a billion US dollars annually. Um, never mind the fact that uh, it is open that the Uganda military is uh, culpable for gross human rights abuses. It is head, uh, heading the Uganda military and police is heading the list of gross human rights uh, abusers. Uh, the United States continue to sponsor that. Uh, why do I say the U U.S. continues to sponsor that? Because they know what exactly they are sponsoring. Many times we've uh, raised our voices to the United States, asking them to make the respect of democracy, the rule of law, and respect for human rights preconditions for collaboration. Um, it is sad that we have not had uh, a strong response in terms of action. Um, thereby, uh, you know, confirming that indeed uh, the United States is in many ways uh, sponsoring uh, Operation Back Home. Now, I'll close by saying that the United States, when you are introducing it, you introduce it as the world's greatest democracy. So isn't it hypocritical for the world's greatest democracy to be the biggest sponsor of uh, the abuse of democracy in Uganda? That's a question that I will leave to the United States, knowing that um, if America was led by a leader that will you know, be in power for 36 years, it probably would not be the, uh, the great democracy, the great country that we all look up to. So the question is, does America want Uganda to be a democracy, a strong democracy like America, or do they still want us to just be as a pawn? As we discuss, maybe we'll attempt that. I thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much, Bobby. I like where you started because it leads me to the question I was going to follow up with, because you said 
basically a foundation that looks at what the US is doing now that is aggravating human rights violations or somewhat showing that they could be doing more, but there is something that's not being done. So my question really is looking at um, the future, what do you think the US could do to genuinely improve the situation in your country? If you had, for would instance- you kind, Would you kindly start the question again? Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yes, so I was just alluding to the fact that you gave a good background of what the US is doing to contribute to the human rights situation in Uganda. And my follow-up question was going to center around looking at the future. What, in your view, is something that the US could do that could be helpful in improving the situation in your country? If you had a moment with the president, for instance, the president of America and the secretary of state, what would be your message to them? Um, in one statement, I would say, do not sponsor our oppression. Do not pay our oppressors because Uganda um, largely um, depends on foreign aid and the U.S. being our biggest donor, they know what exactly they are sponsoring. Um, we, could, like, we could write a whole book about that, but our request has been precise. Please make democracy, the rule of law and respect for human rights preconditions for collaboration because it shouldn't be charity, it's collaboration. This are uh, a collaboration of equals. Let it be about the values, the values that bring us together, democracy, respect for human rights, and the rule of law. Thank you so much, um, Bobby. I think I'll bring in Kawala into the conversation because as an advocate for human rights, you've also seen many occasions in which the United States has pushed hard to defend human rights and punish human rights violators. But you're also coming from a country where the US along with others such as the EU and France have formed long-standing partnerships with, or with authoritarian incumbents and so become complacent in human rights violation. Do you see the U.S. as a joining partner, particularly looking at your country? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm also uh, delighted to be a part of this conversation today. I think it's um, uh, extremely timely as we kind of sit and wait for U.S. Uh, midterm election results within the next couple of hours. Um, where we're going to find out whether the U.S. itself is uh, going to really remain a democracy. I think that this is a very uh, interesting time because uh, the U.S. is is fighting for its own democracy uh, right now. And I am maybe a little bit more uh, jaded than uh, Bobby Wine. I think uh, one thing that's very important for us to realize as Africans is that um, there is no country that is promote, promoting democracy in the world. There never has been. Uh, it does not e e exist. Countries promote their interests in relationships with other countries. And I think that what we need to um, discuss as Africans is what are the interests that we have in common with the United States. Right now, we have in common um, the need for functional states in Africa. And I'm not talking about democracy. I am simply talking about the, a state that functions. So a state that is present, that is able to know its citizens, able to provide basic services, water, electricity, healthcare, education to its citizens, um, a state that is able to provide hope to its citizens. Um, hope means that citizens believe in this country's tomorrow. Um, if you believe in your country's tomorrow, then you don't you don't emigrate. You don't move to go to another country. You don't become uh, an 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 illegal Im immigrant uh, across the Sahara, across the Mediterranean, through the. Um, South America to try to get to to the U.S. Um, the the U.S. Uh, has just dispersed in the last couple of months a billion dollars um, to help Africa deal with 
uh, food insecurity that is due to mainly due to climate change and conflict. Um, now, uh, this disbursement is taking place because we have so many states in Africa that are simply unable and have actually become the causes of uh, not adapting to climate change, the causes of conflict, uh, conflict in Africa is almost systematically a direct result of decades of bad governance. Um, and um, at a time when U.S. interests are in uh, are in, in the line of fighting for its global position as the world reconfigures itself. Right now, the US is trying to fight for its position in, in relationship to China and, and, and Asia as a whole, China and India, and in relationship to, the, to Russia. And as we see at this time, Africa, uh is uh the partner that that all of these uh big global powers are are seeking however it is in the us's best interest that one we are functional and two we we progressively eliminate autocracy in africa because uh these autocratic states are also by and large dysfunctional. So what should the US do um, in, in light of common interests, not in light of uh, because they, they love us, they're going to promote democracy for us, but in light of common interests, which is that Africans should be able to take care of this uh, uh, one of the largest and youngest uh, populations on the face of the earth, um, the U.S. needs to rethink the way that it is partnering with Africa. One is that on the continental level, yes, the U.S. should partner with Africa based on the shared principles and values that are in the African charters, the African Charter for uh, Democracy and Good Governance, the African charters um, that all of our countries have signed up to, that should be the basis for um, cooperation. But within that continental approach, the US needs to distinguish on a country by country basis the and based on the level of functionality of the state and autocracy in the state needs to distinguish its approach. So you cannot have the same development policy for Equatorial Guinea, uh, Cameroon, or Uganda as you do for Botswana, for um, uh, Mauritius, or, or even Ghana and Kenya. Um, so you need to have a differentiated strat strategy. And in that differentiated strategy to, in my opinion, the most important thing is not aid. Um, uh, while aid is important to many countries, I think the US plays a much bigger role in um, as the largest contributor to the international financial institutions. So while uh, USAID is carrying out uh, seminars for 50 people in Uganda on uh, electoral voting rights um, or uh, how to get more women into uh, an electoral process, which is not one to begin with because we're talking about this dictatorships. So while they're doing that through State Department and USAID and so on, they are at the same time contributing to the IMF who will be loaning uh, the loans of Cameroon, for example, at this time uh, from the IMF is $900 million. This is after we have taken $300 million post COVID uh, that the audit, the, the Cameroonian government's own audit showed that the state stole 70 to 80% of that money. Then they turned around and went back to the IMF and renewed and got a $600 million loan. 
So to, to agree with Bobby Wine, basically what we're seeing here with aid and with the uh, international financial institutions is the financing of autocracy and the financing of dysfunctionality because this money is what number one it's a loan and so it has to be paid back but number two is that it is providing no services and it is helping to keep autocracies in place so uh just to 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 conclude today in africa we are faced with over close to 150 million people who are facing acute food insecurity. We have 36 million forcibly displaced people. We have debt, which is 58% of GDP across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We are faced with some of the biggest governance challenges on the globe. We need governments that are functional, that are competent, that are extremely creative and innovative to face this. And what we are getting instead is the US and a global international system that is supporting autocratic and dysfunctional governments. We can't continue this way. way. We need to completely rethink the way that the global institutions from the UN to the IMF are dealing with autocracies and especially dysfunctional autocracies in Africa. And um, we need to do that. They need to rethink the system, but also engage, especially in autocracies, with non-state actors that are really, really important in redefining how we develop this relationship. Let me stop there. Thanks so much, Ka, for that. And I'm really glad you brought up the issue of multilateral institutions. You know, you mentioned the IMF and the World Bank, you know, both of which often give huge loans to African countries, sums that are far more lucrative than anything comparable to foreign aid. And you laid out some of those figures, but you also went into the issue of how these zones, of course, often prop up ruthless dictatorships. And, you know, we'd be remiss not to mention that the Bia regime in Cameroon, for example, just marked 40 years in power this past weekend. And we know we know that there will be U.S. officials listening to the show today. We know that there will be um, folks from these global institutions. So I want to press you a bit more and just ask you directly, you know, what would your advice be to them on how to reconcile this very clearly dissonant reality, this, this issue of financing dysfunctionality, as you so aptly put it, what can be done concretely, substantively to, to address this situation, um, whether it's the role of the US, the role of the US in these multilateral institutions as the biggest donor to them, which you mentioned, what can concretely be done in, in, in a practical way moving forward to, to improve this situation? You know, Jess, it's surprising. What can be done? Apply the rules. Yeah. You, you, it, it is so outstanding to me that, you know, a country like Cameroon, like I said, we we carried out an international campaign against um, the, the, the Cameroon getting new funds from the IMF after they had so mismanaged $300 million in COVID funds. So the audit showed that Cameroon, um, uh, 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 was buying um, materials for COVID at 10 times the, the market price, right? The Ministry of Health. The audit showed that the Minister of Health gave, uh, uh, the Secretary General in the Ministry of Health gave contracts to his brother who bears the exact same name as, as he does. Um, the audit showed that um, they were, you know, giving contracts. Cameroon has a, a ceiling of about 100 million francs CFA um, over which you cannot um, give contracts without bidding. So these guys were giving systematically giving contracts at 99 million um, francs CFA. Um, the audit showed that companies that had been created in January 2021 um uh one company got over 70 percent of the 
um, of the contracts, it was created in January 2021, had never done any business in Cameroon, and then all of a sudden was getting um, COVID funds, uh, COVID contracts for over 100 million. So they violated every single rule of public finance management that you can think of and, and, and some that you, you cannot imagine. Um, and after this audit, after our campaign, we wrote to the to to the IMF. We actually got a meeting with the IMF. Um, you know, after all of this evidence, the IMF turned around and gave Cameroon six hundred million dollars in a regular um, in a regular loan. Um, and um, there have been no repercussions for Cameroon. So what we were asking in our advocacy to the IMF was don't give Cameroon any more money until they tell you what they're going to change in their public finance management system, because if things went so badly wrong, uh, it means the system isn't working. So let's engage on a real reform process and let's condition any new money on that reform. Number two, we said the people, the individuals are really well known. So don't give them any more money until these individuals are gone um, and, and, and have been replaced. Um, you know, our third request was for the publishing of the audit, because at the time we were advocating, Cameroon had not officially published the audit. Well, we got one out of three um the publishing of the audit so um they got new money without changing a single thing in the public financial management system they got new money without firing a single person all of the individuals who manage those covid funds are still in their positions so you know it's amazing it's not rocket science it's not anything extraordinary you know you and i cannot go to our banker and and take a loan and completely mismanage the loan and then come back for more money we can't do that and so we're asking that basic you know the most basic of rules be followed this would be so huge in helping those of us in the countries who put our lives on the line to ask for accountability from our governments if these international institutions were asking for minimal accountability, we would have much more functional states. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that for that valuable contribution, Kai. I really appreciate it. I want to shift gears a little bit here and bring Zachariah in. Um, as a scholar, obviously, you look at the evidence in a balanced and systematic way. And as someone who has studied social movements, for example, across Africa, I, we thought you had a really unique vantage point to the issues we're discussing today. Um, we wanted to talk a bit about your research and what you have found to be the most important ingredients for affecting real substantive change on the ground in terms of respect for human rights and holding leaders accountable. Some of the issues that Kai and, and Bobby before her were just discussing. Obviously, local agency and, and meeting the needs of local populations uh, are paramount, but does the US have a role to play here? And if so, how does official U.S. policy fit into this broader equation? We would love your thoughts on that. Sure, and thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here with Kai and Bobby in particular. Um, and I don't want to. Sorry about that. So thank you so much for for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be on this panel. It's an honor to be uh, with Kai and Bobby in particular. And I don't want to repeat too much of what they've already shared. I just would endorse a, a lot of the opinions that they has, have already been expressed. Um, what I would say as a, as a scholar and as a U.S. citizen, you know, I think uh, a lot of the outrage that we have around the U.S.-Africa relationship um, is really a, a, a feature, not a bug, of the larger system of how foreign policy is made in the United States. Um, you know, if you actually look, there's a very interesting document called the Africa Strategy. Uh, document that was released in August, and I revisited that ahead of our discussion today. And it's uh, an extraordinary document in the sense that it's, you know, uh, it, it, it suggests three pillars of U.S. policy towards Africa. Um, and the one positive one, of course, is the, this desire uh, to combat democratic backsliding, as it's referred to in the document. 
but it's sort of uh, positioned alongside two other priorities, which is to expand trade opportunities with the continent. And then the third one, of course, to increase security partnerships. And so the question is, you know, how do these three things fit together? And is there a sort of, you know, are they supposed to be sequential? Are they supposed to be co-equal? Uh, and I think what's very clear from this is that, you know, they are uh, actual priorities being listed uh, with democracy and democracy promotion being the least significant of this, right? So uh, in my view, security becomes the, the uh, premier concern as Bobby was giving us the example of the Ugandan case. Uh, trade is a, is a close second. And any sort of effort to promote democracy is a, is a distinct third uh, in terms of US priorities. And you can tell this very clearly from the document because the other thing that the document does uh, very clearly uh, is it lists China and Russia over 10 times in, in a relatively short 17 page document. And so throughout uh, this document, which is really meant to be a guide for how the US engages with African countries, you can see over and over a, a very explicit appeal an effort to contrast the US as a good partner for African countries in contrast to the Chinese and to the Russians. Right? And I don't think we have any desire here to defend or, or to romanticize what China and Russia are doing on the continent, but it's really striking that really the document's not about Africa at all. Right? Really, it just sort of positions African countries uh, as part of this larger geopolitical competition uh, and suggests that Africans would be uh, naive, uh, ignorant, uh, stupid, even if they didn't choose to partner with the U.S. in, in favor of the Chinese or the Russians. Uh, and I and I want to suggest that it's not just the document that that makes this position. If you if you uh, look at what the U.S. Congress has actually done, you know, in a few months ago they passed uh, the Countering Malign Russian Influence Activities in Africa Bill. Uh, this is a really weird and strange piece of legislation that passed with overwhelming support from both Republicans and Democrats. The vote was actually 415 to 9 in the House, uh, which is extraordinary in this era of supposed polarization in the United States. Um, and it's basically, you know, is the real only real legislation that has passed around US Africa foreign policy by the US Congress. And it has nothing to do with the interests of African countries, let alone African peoples. Right. Uh, it's really, again, a, a document that shows that the way that the U.S. is conceptualizing our relationship to African countries is, is around these larger geopolitical competitions. And so it's no surprise to come to your question uh, that by and large, you know, the social movements that have exploded across Africa over the past decade, primarily led by young people, uh, are not able to find much of a receptive audience in Washington. I mean, that in general, uh, even where Washington is trying to, you know, uh, offer uh, what I would consider to be primarily rhetorical support to pro-democracy forces, democracy forces in Africa, uh, that this is often hollow support, to, you know, providing uh, some trainings, um, providing some funding uh, to occasional figures who, who, who kind of rise to attention for various reasons, but no real effort to reevaluate the nature of our relationships with so many autocrats across the continent. Uh, no real effort to take any risks and to, to uh, position ourselves as a true democratic champion in contrast to our Russian and Chinese rivals. Uh, and so unfortunately, I don't look at the United States, uh, despite, you know, some nice people working at US, you know, the National Democratic Institute and elsewhere, uh, who I, I do believe mean well, uh, that fundamentally, I don't think that they are uh, really uh, going to have any larger influence in reshaping how the US uh, understands African countries uh, as primarily, you know, uh, junior partners in, in our larger security and economic objectives. Thank you so much, um, Zakaria. I think like one of the points that you mentioned, the idea that there's a lot of frustration around just the design, how the policy in the US is made. And this idea as well that um, because it's not necessarily a focus about or a focus on the interests of the African people. That's why you tend to see that the different changes in administration also in a lot of instances changes the interests um, on Africa. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have and why we're having this conversation today to say, how do we flip from the space that we're in where we're constantly adjusting ourselves as a continent to fit into the strategies of the US administration into a continent that is able to say, these are our priorities, this is what we want, and then the US and other players can actually fit into it. So I think that's very, very important. And then the one question I wanted to ask you though was, 
just looking at the fact that there are important connections between Africa and America, both in terms of the diaspora, the flow of ideas and remittances, and in terms of the African American community as well, which has contributed a number of US Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs over the years. So how do you think this can be harnessed to build a stronger and more effective relationship that represents a genuine partnership with respect for African agency? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a it's a hugely important observation. If we if we look, you know, sort of at the longer history uh, of the relationship between diasporic Americans and, and African politics, we can see that, you know, Black Americans in particular have had a long history uh, of championing African issues uh, to the US government and to international agencies. So if you go back to the anti-colonial struggles uh, of the 1940s and 1950s, figures like W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, Ralph Bunch and others were, were very prominent voices in U.S. foreign policy circles, uh, pushing the United States to 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 recognize uh, liberation movements across the continent, and oftentimes were quite successful in those efforts. Uh, if we look at the anti-apartheid struggle of the 1980s and 1990s, again, it was uh, a lot of organizations established by Black Americans uh, who played this role uh, in pushing the U.S. government, which was a close partner of the apartheid state. Uh, to abandon apartheid uh, and were ultimately successful in that regard. And I think, you know, again, now with the with the sort of rise of African immigrant communities across the United States, you know, I teach at, at the City University of New York and the sheer number of students that, that I have uh, who have roots on the on the continent uh, has really brought a, a fresh infusion uh, of potential voices to start lobbying the US government. And unfortunately, I don't think those voices have 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 really uh, uh, broken through quite yet, not certainly compared to these previous efforts uh, to insert that diaspora into foreign policy discussions. And so what I would like to see a lot more of is better coordination. Um, you know, I think one thing that the earlier generations of Black Americans did well uh, is to keep the focus on the big picture. You know, any individual African country is never going to be a priority for, for the U.S. government, but Africa as a whole um, is certainly something that 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 is a, 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 an important site for U.S. foreign policy going forward, uh, and so more Pan-African solidarity uh, to pressure the U.S. government to stop funding autocracies to to create more equitable economic policies. Um, I think that is a, a better strategy um, than than sort of trying to fight as individual countries and, and hoping that the U.S. might take notice. Um, I think that, you know, in general, there is a, a, a lot of, of, of individuals in the Biden administration, um, you know, including the current U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, including many other figures who are uh, Black Americans who have longstanding interests in Africa, uh, who could be targeted uh, with certain kinds of appeals uh, to perhaps pressure the Biden administration to revamp. Uh, it's Africa policy. I mean, I think that the, the benign neglect um, and often you know, detrimental uh, approach that U.S. has taken to, to Africa is not unique. Uh, that has been going on uh, across Democratic and Republican administrations. And so, you know, who knows what the, the future holds, but I do think the Biden administration, because it has a, a higher number uh, of African-Americans in government, uh, might be a, a, a significant opportunity to, to start. Um, I don't want to romanticize, you know, the, the possibility of change. Uh, but to start to to shift uh, the perspective of how the U.S. government has been approaching Africa policy uh, for too long now, and I think you know it, it, the, the diaspora will have a huge role to play in that. Excellent. Thanks so much, Zachary. We're at the point now where we typically go uh, to our discussion, but Ka, I see that you wanted to come in here and and, and contribute something very quickly. So uh, one minute over to you. Thank you. One minute. Um, I, I just wanted to, to um, you know, really reinforce what Zachariah is saying. One, um, that you, I think we need to be more cynical. I'm sorry. We need to, you know, the, this idea that the U.S. is going to defend African interests or look out for Af African interests is just it's it, that's not the way the world works and we should also be careful do we ask the us to look out for france's interests when they deal with france or to look out for germany's interests i think that we as africans need to understand what is our place what is the geo strategic strategic moment and we can only succeed together so bringing 
groups that are fighting and and we are in this moment where there's an explosion of groups on the ground that are fighting for African justice, African democracy and so on. We need to talk to each other better. We need to 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 build. I am always amazed that today with the internet, with all the means we have, we are not as connected uh, between Africa and the African American community as they were in the 60s, um, as they were in the fight for, for apartheid. We just wrote a book about women, women uh, connecting across continents um, that's coming out next week. So I really think that you know, this is where the key is and that we need to stop with the let's hope that America takes into account African interests. They're not going to. They don't. And, and, and is that their place? That's not their place. Africans need to take into account African interests and we need to be at that table negotiating with all of our leverage um, for, for those interests. Um, maybe if I could. Uh... Yeah, Bobby, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, I want to thank Ka for being straightforward. Um, but that's typical of African women, very straightforward. Um, I am personally struggling to be polite uh, in my communication uh, because I don't want to sound angry, but I'm actually angry. You know, I'm trying as much as possible to avoid words like hypocrisy, words like uh, intellectual dishonesty. Um, however, uh, Carr represents me a great deal. We indeed are not asking the United States to save us. We are only saying, stop sponsoring our oppression. We're not asking you to come save us. We are trying to save ourselves, but we're being held back, you know, because we, can, we, we we are trying to fight to save ourselves, but we cannot fight against the American uh, the American dollars. We cannot fight against the American trained soldiers uh, and, and and the American weapons. Um, I will also want to add a word too about the issue of interest. And Carl mentioned it. Uh, it's about interest. Uh, unfortunately, these interests in many ways come off not as moral interests. Because the first interest that brings us together as international community is morality, moral interests. However, General Museveni in our case, and just like many other dictators all over the world, particularly in Africa, have learned how to play the interests of the international community. For example, in the context of Uganda, uh, when General Museveni is drawing closer to the Chinese and closer to the Russians, he plays a, bla a blackmail card. Uh, he blackmails the United States, and you will find the United States rushing to deal with General Museveni in order not him to go deal with China. In any case, China, and, and in many ways, Russia, you know, give aid, uh, mainly military aid, to Uganda without any condition. They don't put conditions of human rights. They don't put conditions of democracy because they're not democratic themselves. So that way, uh, the United States seems to be falling in the trap. I want to believe that the United States knows exactly what they are doing. And uh, it frustrates many democracy lovers to see that democracy and human rights is put on the periphery. It, this is just business. And uh, I want to say that that is immoral. And also, the United States frustrates uh, democracy lovers and lovers of institutions when they move on to deal with General Museveni as an individual. And I want to believe the same thing with uh, other dictators uh, like in Cameroon and others, you know, dealing with an individual, not a nation that you know, legitimizes the, the takeover of institutions uh, here in Uganda. A few days ago, um, Ugandans were horrified by a statement that was made by the United States representative to the United Nations, uh, a one um, Linda Thomas Greenfield, uh, that is the United States representative to the United States. She said a few days ago, and I quote, I, I want to quote, we, the United States, still have 
strong partnership with General Museveni. He has been and continues to be a strong leader in the region. Now, uh, the United States, I wonder how it's going to explain to the world that it's not propping up strong men instead of strong institutions. So um, this comes at the backdrop of a rigged election last year, the United States Foreign Department issued a statement discrediting the 2021 uh, presidential elections where United States election observers were blocked from observing that election, an election that happened with a closed internet. I was the uh, main challenger to General Museveni, but I was put under house arrest. My entire campaign team was arrested. Many of them are still languishing in military prison. Many people were massacred on the 18th and 19th of November 2020 during the campaign. Uh, just a few days from now, we're going to be um, you know, observing the second anniversary of that mass murder. Unfortunately, with all that, uh, the United States tends to continue of not being with a dictatorship. So I want to conclude by saying that the United States looks really with a tainted image, hobnobbing with a known dictator, and yet it is known as the world's greatest democracy. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Bobby, for, for speaking up and, and speaking your truth, and certainly to Ka and to Zachariah as well. I think, obviously, we've talked a lot today about the, the evident disparity between rhetoric and reality in terms of US foreign policy, particularly as it pertains to Africa, which is a very good segue uh, to today's uh, discussion with Elizabeth Shackelford, who wrote an entire book on this subject. So you're not the only ones who are frustrated. You have many frustrated people within uh, the US government as well. So with that said, I'm going to turn the stage over to our colleague, Nick Cheeseman, and to Lizzie, today's discussion to get their respective reactions to the show and the contributions thus far and mainly to address the questions, uh, many of them, uh, which came through our WhatsApp and on our social media pages over the past few days, including today. Uh, so Nick, over to you. Thanks so much, Jeff. And uh, as always, a massive pleasure to be on the show with people like Bobby Kahn and Zach. Uh, great comments from everybody so far. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, it's a real pleasure that we have you here. You are known, of course, not only as being someone who resigned in 2017 to call attention to the declining state of diplomacy under the Trump administration, but as Jeff said, for your fantastic book, The Dissent Channel, which won an award in which I encourage everybody here to go out and get. Maybe Jeff can put a, a message out on Twitter after this of a link to the book so people who hear you can, can follow it up. You will have uh, heard many of the comments, um, but you'll also have a different perspective coming from someone who's been an insider. I'd love for you know your perspective back on what you've heard so far. For everybody else, just to say that you know Lizzie's going to give her feedback. I'll throw in a few comments. Then I'm going to read some of the many, many questions we've got from across the continent today. And I have to say, this has been one of the biggest responses we've ever had. Um, for those in the meeting, I'm going to put them in the chat to give you an advance to have a look at the question I'm going to ask you before it comes up. So for the speakers, check out the chat for the question coming up. Lizzie, the floor is yours. All right. Well, I'll start by saying I don't think that my perspective is that different from what we've heard today. Um, as someone who was on the inside and watched a lot of these decisions being made you know, in real time, um, South Sudan was uh, was where I served and what I wrote most of my book about. But you know, the challenge that we saw there um, over and over again was, was very much the same. The short term focus on security, uh, which ended up with a long term cost to our own national security interests. I'm going to ring the bell that Ka said over and over again. You're not going to persuade the U.S. to do better by saying, you know, uh, help Africa better. I mean, that's not going to happen. All nations are out for their own uh, selfish interests. And that's OK, because once again, Ka, I'm sorry, I'm just stealing everything from you. But what you said was great. Uh, which is, you know, um, on these governments that are bad governments, autocratic governments uh, are bad for security. They're bad for long term stability. They do not create good trade partners. They do not create reliable security partners in the end. We've seen this over and over again. I do think it's as Bobby has gone over and over again with Uganda. It's a classic example of how the United States um, for its own short term national security interest props up a bad government that creates a bad situation in that country. Um, I think part of this is kind of natural. Uh, it's something that you have to overcome in a democracy because 
any administration is going to be looking at their short term interest. So you've got to find a way to change the paradigm so that the folks on the insta inside fully understand that the long term interest of the United States with its relationship with different countries across the continent is in not in having kind of uh, you know, hard standing strong men and autocrats, but it's in having functional uh, functional democratic governments that um, you know, provide services, uh, provide stability, and provide that hope that Kyle was also talking about. Um, the truth is, on the inside, uh, you know, in the National Security Council in the U.S., there is an understanding of this with the folks who cover Africa. But in this great wild, wide world where the U.S. is overextended in a lot of places, um, those interests um, are often undermined by the bigger picture. You see that Africa strategy that came out. They basically did control, find, replace, counterterrorism with great power competition in order to try and make sure that it rose to the top of the queue, or at least somewhere in the queue of national security interests. But I, you know, I would say we're not going to get um, you know this administration or the next administration to focus on on all of the important long term kind of generational change that that needs to be done. So my personal thought as someone who's been on the inside is to focus on much like what Bobby was saying, just stop doing the bad stuff. You know, it's not necessarily, there's the sense that doing more is better in terms of the US relationship with Africa. If we pour more money into it, if we pour more soldiers into it, if we pour more, you know, sell more weapons into it, that that shows that we care more. But the real challenge is when what we're doing is actually undermining the long-term security in these places. So I would just leave with, um. Uh, I know we've got lots of questions to get to and a really great panel to answer them. So I'd just say two, two takeaways for me, which really do just mirror what we've heard from the other excellent panelists, which is, you know, stop propping up dictators. You can make that case to the American people by talking about that billion dollar industry of what we pour into places like Uganda and the bad that it has done. You know, take it back to taxpayers. Just don't spend that money. How about we do we do less and focus on doing it with countries that are moving in the right direction? Um, and always, you know, make those arguments based on what's in the U.S. national security interest, because, you know, as much as we like to wax poetic on how much we care about democracy, at the end of the day, that is not what our policy decisions are made on. Thanks so much. There's more, more food for thought there. I'm going I'm to try and throw in uh, maybe one more critical thought, or there may be a more optimistic one, to see if we can get up to sort of thinking about what might be done in the future. You know, we are coming up to a US-Africa summit. There might be some scope for moving things uh, under the Biden administration, at least compared to where things were under the Trump administration. Uh, the more critical thought is that I think, you know, the recent experience for many African citizens, commentators and leaders of watching the West in Ukraine has been quite instructive and quite disappointing in the sense that they've seen, perhaps for the first time, quite how effectively the international community can move in an emergency. And watching the West move like that for Ukraine and not for the famine, for example, in the Horn of Africa or West Africa, or for the multiple other conflicts taking place on the African continent, has been a good reminder that those things aren't happening, not because it's not possible, but because there's not the prioritization. And I think in some ways that's brought into sharp relief for a lot of people, some of the hypocrisies and inequalities. You know, think about the large numbers of Ukrainian refugees, you know, accepted into the UK at the same time as we have a Home Secretary talking about invasions of people and trying to stop, you know, desperately poor people crossing the channel in rubber dinghies. That, that contrast, that, that comparison, I think, really brought out some of the issues that have come out today. The more optimistic, you know, thought that I wanted to just fly was that, you know, I don't think it's true that everything that's been done, you know, has been problematic or that everything that has been done has been unsuccessful. I think that the argument that we've heard, it's most you know, very persuasive is first do no harm. And I think that's very powerful. But I think it is important to say that there have been some beneficial developments, right, that have been funded by the international community. Uh, the higher number of women in parliament, I think, has been an important campaign. Funnily enough, it's not something America or the UK has managed back home, but the support of donors for that has made a difference in a lot of African states. We can argue about whether or not that's substantive. Uh, we have seen, you know, international community, for example, supporting judiciaries, and that has contributed, not the major factor, but it's contributed to the efforts of judges to break uh, more judicial independence in countries like Kenya and Malawi, which has played an important role in those countries over the last few years. So I think it's important we don't completely throw out the, you know, the baby with the bathwater. 
and we perhaps try and use the last you know 20 minutes 30 minutes to think about more concrete recommendations that we can put forward whilst absolutely taking on board what everybody has said and the cynicism uh, that we've heard from all of our speakers so far with that in mind i'm gonna ask your questions now we'll go in the order in which you spoke so bobby i'm coming to you first uh just for everybody reminded they're in the chat if you want to check them out quickly so bobby the question here is from someone who wants to know a little bit more about what Museveni does to make himself so attractive to America. I mean, what has he done over the past 20 years to get this kind of lock on international support, where, as you said, he can commit the most heinous human rights abuses and still remain a key partner? What is he doing? How is he doing it? Are others following suit? Asks a questioner on our WhatsApp. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you will allow me answer the question in two ways. First, what he has been doing uh, i can be sure of what he has been doing and maybe suggest on uh, on what he is doing what general seven has been doing for the last uh, 36 years is painting a rosy picture of his rule and uganda he has been able to smartly deceive the international community you will notice that uh, president bill clinton back in the 90s described general Museveni as a new breed of leaders you know um 36 years in power general Museveni has spent a lot of billions of taxpayers money in uganda are paying lobbyists in the international community paying uh you know companies to paint a rosy picture of his rule and yes he has presented himself as a benevolent dictator, as a Democrat. And part of our effort was to show, to unmask, to pull off the mask of General Museveni. When I ran for president last year, it's not that I was not aware of the situation. I was aware of the militarism, but because we knew that we had media on us, we wanted the international community to see what General Museveni is realistically and we were able to show the world the world can no longer pretend not to know what general seven is the united states can no longer pretend not to know that they are propping up a tyrant and we always have put a question that when uh taylor did to the liberians what general seven is doing to ugandans he was sanctioned when mugabe did what Museveni is doing he was sanctioned when saddam hussein did what general seven is doing he was sanctioned when idi amin did what general seven is doing he was sanctioned why then general seven is not being sanctioned we believe that the united states in many ways you know it's looking at interests and yeah uh, many times they've uh, uh, pointed at security and the war against terrorism which we agree with but we have told them time and again that they should deal with the country not an individual they should deal with inst institutions not an individual so i can say that i know what general seveni has been doing in the past lying and deceiving and uh, painting a rosy picture of democracy and putting up fake elections to justify that we have democracy. But right now, just last year, the United States election observers we are blocked from, from uh, uh, observing the elections. The United States knows that besides all the massacres that have been carried out, besides the Kasese massacre, just two years ago, just under two years ago, more than 150 innocent citizens we are massacred on the street and nothing has happened so um allow me to throw back the question on the table what general seven is doing right and uh also to ask that is the international community is the united states you know enticed by evil is it enticed by violence is it trying to prove to us that we who are nonviolent cannot be supported but those that are violent are supported. That's a question that I want to bounce back to you. Thanks so much, Bobby. I think, you know, my answer to this is partly what Lizzie put in the chat, which is, I think one of the things that, you know, Museveni has been particularly good at is finding the one thing the West wants and giving it to them. You know, at one point that was a development partner. It was somebody who would lead on HIV AIDS. 
Then when that dried up, it was Ugandan troops in Somalia. He's consistently tried to find the one thing that could make him attractive to a Western audience. And I once wrote in my book, Democracy in Africa, that if, you know, if there was ever a kind of world championships for manipulating the international community, uh, Museveni would win the gold medal every time because he finds that one thing. And it's no, it's no coincidence, right, that as soon as a leader starts to have some troubles with their allies internationally, Paul Kagame, they start throwing troops at peacekeeping operations and into other countries because then they become indispensable. And all of a sudden they can treat their citizens back home however they want, but because they're supporting international you know, programs in other countries, all of a sudden they get a pass. And I've talked to people you know, who've been involved in the administration of many countries who, like Lizzie says, are desperately you know, trying to promote democracy, who have said to me, as soon as those troops went in, our ability to speak truth to power in that country went away. So I think you're absolutely right. But I think it's also, you know, we also need to be clearer, I think, about how good some leaders are at manipulating international preoccupations and the things that Carl has said to basically keep themselves in power. Now, Carl, coming to you now. Uh, the question for you was, are there any international donors out there doing a better job? We've been pretty tough on the United States tonight. Are there good examples? Is there anybody you see out there who is doing a good job? Is there anyone, Bobby, you can come in again on Uganda. Is there anyone on Uganda you see as being credible and consistent and pro-democratic, Carl, from your point of view? Is there anyone in Cameroon that you see as being, you know, credible? Uh, you know, we, we, we talked about America, but of course, this is a big realm of international donors. Is there somebody else out there doing best practice that the US could follow? So I'm I'm uh, also I, I I will get to to that question, but I think that um, the 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 undermining of democracy, rule of law, and um, you know, and especially the fight of Africans on the ground for democracy in their countries is is what is fundamentally wrong. You are doing harm. So, um, you know, you gave an example, uh, and I think somebody in the chat gave the example about um, women. Well, if you have an uh, autocratic government in place and it has more women in it, um, excuse me, I, I, I'm a feminist, I fight for women's rights, uh, but be uh, having more women who, uh, you know, adhere to his philosophy of autocracy does absolutely nothing for me as a woman and does absolutely nothing for me in, in my country. And I think this is what is wrong with development cooperation is that if you if you if you want to compromise, you know, the fundamental um, uh, foundation of a nation because, you know, yay, we trained uh, uh, 30 more women in entrepreneurship. Um, you know, this is you're compromising your own interests. And I think this is where, you know, Lizzie really put the finger on it, which is how do we get uh, um, administrations that are elected for four years and need to get results in four years to understand that you know the the long term interests of their countries are inextricably linked to our long term um, interests. Yes, you send peacekeeping forces um, to support you know whatever initiative is going on um, internationally, but your your human rights violations, your lack of respect for rule of law is going to create the next security situation. Um, and, and what's outstanding to me is that this has been happening for decades. The US supported Mobutu for how long? And almost the length of time they supported Mobutu is how long Congo has been one of the most conflict ridden, you know, in uh, basket cases for the world once Mobutu was gone. So it's like this stuff is, again, it's, you know, if you look at it from an interest base, the interests of the West are as a whole, and the US in particular, are in creating, you know, these, the in, in, in supporting, you know, these fundamental pillars to functioning democratic societies in Africa. So yes, international donors, um, uh, 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 international aid as a whole on a micro level, there are a lot of amazing things that are done. 
Um, you know, I don't want to throw out the, the, the baby with the, the, with, with the bath water. Um, even in the seminars for democracy, which I questioned quite a bit, um, there, are, there are things which are done in, in teaching. It, it is important to teach Cameroonians who've lived under 40 years of BIA to remind them what rule of law is, to remind them what fundamental human rights are, because we, we forget. We live under oppression for so long that we forget you know, and, and and we're not conscious of what our fundamental rights are anymore. So yes, those things are important. All the things which are being done in agriculture, in our entrepreneurship, um, with women, with young people, all of those things are, are really, really important. But if we don't get the fundamentals right, there's no place to put those things. Mm -hmm. There's no way that they that that you know training the 50 entrepreneurs will impact Cameroon on scale if we do mm -hmm. not get rule of law in Cameroon and if we do not get a state that is you know um, fundamentally concerned about its citizens enough to provide electricity, to provide water. You know, how are you gonna entrepreneur in a continent where, you know, one out of every two people doesn't have access to electricity? So I think we, we, we have been, um, because the fundamentals are difficult, they are complex. Um, you know, here we have not talked about the coup d'etats uh, uh, within the last couple of years in Africa, which are basically the result of the you know support both on our continent and globally of because we have been supporting or and 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 uh what do you say um uh, uh, ignoring these rulers who changed the constitution to stay in power we now have young people and armies who are like you guys can't get rid of them well we're gonna get rid of them we're gonna get rid of them with a gun and then now we have a real mess <laughs> because that ruler is gone, but we've got guys with guns in, 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 in charge of the country. So I think we're really at a crucial moment for Africa. We cannot do the surface stuff. We cannot be satisfied with these small little wins anymore. The, the, the continent is in serious, serious trouble, and we need partners that will enable us to have leaders that are able to look at these fundamentals. Thanks so much. And I think one of the things there, I just really want to echo, I saw Jeff actually punching the air in celebration when you hit some of those brilliant points. But one of the points, which I think we've tried to echo a lot on the Resistance Bureau, is that if you consistently prop up authoritarian leaders, you create the crisis that you think they're solving for you, right? You think that the big man is protecting you from unrest, from dis, you know, uh, you help you think he's helping you with your foreign policy you think he's helping you fight terrorism but what you're doing is you're creating the next crisis and you said that there in beautifully in two different ways both in terms of sort of long-term unrest and civil war and the context in zaire drc but also in terms of the coup so i just think that's such a brilliant point bobby did you want to come in there is there on the point about it is there anyone out there you think is, is doing a good job i mean Kaz made a great point there don't just do the small stuff if you do lots of great small stuff and don't do the big stuff, the small stuff isn't going to help us. But is there anyone that you see internationally, you know, that you think is a good example that people can follow? Uh, you mean the leaders? Internet, yeah, other donors, you know, other different countries, different leaders uh, who- Without, you know, a, doubt, without a doubt, the international donors are doing a great job. And I'll speak in the context of Uganda, where the government has completely failed uh to deliver services um it will be recall, re recalled that uh even the covid 19 funds the funds that were extended to uganda uh to fight covid 19 have all were all mismanaged today the government of uganda was told by the donor community that it's not going to be given cash but it will be given uh utilities and the, uh, the medicines and the thing the things that are needed to fight ebola 19 Unfortunately, by the government of Uganda is still insisting they want cash. Why? Because cash is easy to, you know, to 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 mismanage, and uh, that is what the Ugandan government is known for. We continue to appreciate the friends, uh, the governments, and the donor community that continue to support 
the people of Uganda, the people of Africa, in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, and otherwise. Um, also, individuals, individuals like yourself, individuals like uh, my brother Jeff Smith here, yeah, and all the friends of Africa that continue to raise our voices. I must say that our voices alone as Africans are not enough. In many ways, we try to be as polite as possible, but our friends, uh, the sons and daughters of the, the, those uh, developed countries, the great democracies, have actually gone a notch higher to call out those governments, which is the right thing to do. They are doing a good job. So yeah, while um, those that are supposed to be doing the job are not doing it, those that are uh, whose responsibility it is not are actually doing a good job and we appreciate them. Of course, uh, the citizens are doing a great job. They are paying a high price, uh, arrests, brutalization, even death, but they are still standing strong. I cannot forget to uh, give thanks to them. I also want to conclude by uh, reiterating the question, but rather this time in the assertive, uh, the question was uh, more or less like, does the United States administration do more on democracy or do less by stepping aside and not propping up the tyrants? I would say that the United States can and should do more to defend democracy because that's a value, that's what brings us together to defend human rights. And I will note that here in the context of Uganda, uh, a few years ago, the government of Uganda passed an anti-gay law and the United States and all other international communities rose up in arms. They cut all the aid, they cut all collaboration with the government of Uganda until that law was you know, recalled. Now, this was a law that was against the minority, the rights of the minority. And the United States put its foot down. How about when the rights of the majority are being abused, I thought the United States is supposed to take the same stand or an even firmer stand. Unfortunately, it has not been the case. So I want to mention that the United States should do more in regards to uh, defending democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. And yes, do less on propping up tyrants. Thanks so much, Bobby. Um, I've got a question I'm going to put to Zach and, and maybe I'll add a little bit and come back to you, Lizzie, quickly, and then we'll go back to the uh, to Jeff and Mantadi because we're running out of time. Uh, Zach, your question I put in the in the Q&A was uh, about countries like Liberia and Sierra Leone. We seem to have you know, been able to build a new future on the back of international support and, and aren't there some examples that are a bit more positive that, that we can point to? But I also want to ask you and Lizzie a slightly different thing, which is, you know, if you were in the US Africa summit, you know, one of the things, of course, about these summits is that none of us ever get invited. Uh, maybe we shouldn't, but you know, it's a small number of African leaders who get called. You don't get opposition leaders at US leaders summits generally, or civil society, or commentators, or that many academics. Um, but if you were in the room and you had an opportunity to say something, what is it that you would say to try and you know inch that conversation forwards? I hear what both of you have said. You know, actually, the interests are so ingrained, the issues are so big that you know radical change. I think you've both suggested is you know unfeasible, and, and we would be unwise to hope for it. But if we sort of think about inching towards something that looks like at least a more uh, sophisticated, less objectionable, more consistent policy, what would you say uh, in that room? Uh, that you think might resonate with some of the people there in terms of being able to bring that about. Uh, so Zach, it's kind of two questions. You can answer whichever one you want. Lizzie, I'll come to you for that final part of that question, if that's okay, very quickly before we go back to Jeff and Mantelli. Zach, over to you. Sure. I, I would say that, you know, um, let me try to answer both the questions at, at one time. Uh, and to start, let me say that I would throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. I think that this sort of uh, emphasis on, on small gains in terms of U.S. policy towards Africa or the international community's policies towards Africa uh, is, is a big part of the problem. Right? It, it allows us to, to ignore uh, the actual role that the U.S. plays in Africa, the actual role the international community plays in Africa. And it's a, it's a diversionary tactic that has been used for generations now in terms of how we deal with African countries, uh, where we, we try to, to magnify 
uh, these really, really tiny victories and pretend like they portend uh, some, some larger you know, gains across the continent. And there are structural reasons to be very wary of these patterns. I mean, you know, if Rwandan women, you know, Rwanda has a large number of female parliamentarians on the African continent, higher share than the United States. If Rwandan women you know, started protesting in the streets tomorrow, I don't doubt that Kagame would shoot them down. Um, and I have no doubt that the US would be muted in its response. Right. Uh, so I'm not particularly impressed uh, by these small gains. I think that Africans are demanding larger structural transformations. And I think the international community and the US in particular is preventing them. Right. Uh, so what is the what is what sort of advice would I want to share uh, with my own government if I was invited to pretend, participate in this summit? Uh, as you point out, we are not. Uh, and, maybe, you know, perhaps I shouldn't be invited, but I think there are plenty of people who, who could be and should be. Uh, you know, I know that you know folks in, in in the African diaspora here in the United States have asked for for the possibility of attending, and they've been denied. Um, so I think it's a it's a real problem that that these voices are not being heard and are being systematically excluded. Um, but you know, what I would say is that I think uh, we should learn from history, right? Um, if we look at why the U.S. government has actually done things that have been beneficial for African countries. It is almost never because of uh, moral considerations. Uh, this charge of hypocrisy that Bobby keeps bringing up, as much as I'm sympathetic to it, it simply does not work. Uh, the US is fully aware that it is hypocritical when it comes to foreign policy. As a political scientist, I can tell you that being uh, hypocritical is not uh, exceptional. It is the norm in academia. We, we push governments, uh, we mock governments that, that are not hypocritical. We say that they are naive. Uh, that they're ignorant, they don't understand national interests. Uh, so hypocrisy is the norm, it is expected, right? Uh, and the only thing that seems to, to work are, are, are moments where the US government makes harsh and rational calculations uh, that show that the current strategy is no longer working. And I do think in this particular moment, with the rise of China in particular, uh, China is presenting African governments with an alternative. It is a, an alternative that I you know, find problematic as well, but at the very minimum has the advantage of taking seriously the question of African sovereignty and insisting that anything that it does on the African continent will, will, will ensure that African sovereignty is always respected. This is deeply resonant for leaders in Africa. Uh, I think it's a big part of China's appeal to African governments. And frankly, I think China is winning uh, in its capacity to win over these governments. You know, the U.S. is doing this summit next month, uh, but it's nothing compared to the sort of uh, continuous uh, outreach that Chinese, China does to African governments. And I think, you know, if you look again back to the 1940s uh, with the rise of the Soviet Union, the 1980s and 90s, with the fall of the Soviet Union, those were the kind of broad geopolitical moments that led to shifts in American policy, substantive shifts where the US started to, um, you know, for example, in the 1940s and 50s to push back against European imperialism, uh, in the 1990s to, to push back against uh, the apartheid state. Um, and I think potentially with the rise of China in Africa, we may be entering a new era where government officials start to recognize that our current approach is failing. More and more African governments are turning towards uh, China in particular, uh, as well as other countries in Asia. And if we continue on our current path and don't uh, reevaluate and come up with a new approach, uh, we are going to lose Africa just like we lost Latin America and just like we uh, uh, you know, continue to, to experience a waning of American influence globally. Uh, so that's, that's what I would say is, is to put it into starkly uh, uh, power terms uh, rather than appealing to any sort of moral consciousness. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great idea, right? And you play to the interests, and it's certainly clear that the U.S. is losing traction. It's losing soft power globally by the day. So I think that threat, you know, like you say, and actually playing to power interests rather than playing simply to altruism and the principle of democracy may well be a way to to mobilize more people. And of course, not just in America, right? Exactly the same set of concerns that you just uh, set out apply equally to the UK and other countries as well. Great. Thanks so much for those comments. Lizzie, we're going to come to you to wrap it up. Uh, same question, if you will. And then we'll go back to Jeff Mantari because we're almost out of time. All right. I'm going to pretend like you told me that I get to run the entire agenda for the US Africa Summit. Um, and if that were the case, what I would do. Um, I would I would shift back to and this, this falls perfectly in line with, with what everyone's been saying, but I think the right approach is we're going to focus on 
quality over quantity of relationships on the continent. Not doing a bit of everything that's not very good everywhere, but we're going to work with the with the most promising countries that are meeting us on you know in terms of these values that are having that long term security stability. Um, process that are moving in that direction. I think that, you know, I don't think that I would recommend that we just pull out of everywhere else and kind of shut down our military engagement, our military partnerships and things like that overnight. But I think that you could say something at this summit, like we've got what, three year timeline, maybe five year timeline, but we are going to be rolling back with countries that do not move in that direction. And I think that there's some credibility in this administration having left Afghanistan. And I believe that the US pulling out of Afghanistan when it had after many, many years, a government and a military that was not that was not moving in that direction and not meeting US national security interests there. I think we've got more credible about the idea that we actually are capable of wrapping things up that are not progressing and doing well. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I think that that's a little bit of why what we've seen in Somalia is a bit of a shift with the government taking more of its own kind of direct engagement in the battle against al-Shabaab because they realize maybe the US won't be here for 100 years. So um, I think that's what I do. I would give that I would give countries notice. It's not that we don't like you. It's that we have limited resources. So we're going to put our money where it's going to be the most effective and our political support and our diplomatic support where it's going to be the most effective. Continue doing humanitarian support, continue doing, you know, um, doing assistance to civil society organizations and human rights defenders. But I think that there really should be a shift where we're not trying to out China, China on every part of the continent, but we're going to try and have really high quality partnerships with countries that are going to work with us towards mutually beneficial ends. And I, that would be the approach that I would take. I think that's a great point to end on because, you know, one of the things we've been emphasizing a lot in today's show is the power of the United States for good or for ill. It's also important to remember that great empires and great colonial powers and great foreign powers often get a sense of hubris about their influence abroad. Um, you know, and, and at some point have to come to terms with the fact that they're not as powerful as they once were. Uh, that's certainly been the case for my country, the United Kingdom. I think the US has clearly been there for the last decade. And that kind of question of how do you come to terms of actually trying to do more or you know, the same amount with actually an amount of money that is increasingly becoming a marginal you know, relative to what every other donor is putting into their country. And as Kaya said, in, compared to International Monetary Fund, World Bank, et cetera, you know, making that consideration and coming to terms with your diminishing power in a multipolar world is something that I think is a really great point and one that hopefully somebody will mention in the US Africa Summit. So thanks so much, Lizzie, uh, Zach, Carl, uh, Bobby, brilliant show, lots of fantastic comments. I'm um, sending it back to Mantadi and Jeff to take us home. Because there's so much that we've been learning, but as you've already said that we do not have the time, so we have to bring the show to a close. A special shout out to our panel of experts for a job well done. Our team at the Resistance Bureau looks forward to keeping in touch with all of you and to highlighting the important work that you're doing moving forward. You inspire all of us and thanks again for taking the time to be with us today. And of course, thank you so much to our audience for engaging with us and for tuning in. Please stay in touch with us between shows by visiting our website www.theresistancebureau.com and by subscribing on our homepage to get updates on the program as well as to get our show summaries and participant videos. On our website, you can also revisit past shows, all of which are saved in the episode section. You can also search for us on Apple Podcasts to download our shows there so you can listen anytime. We are also on Twitter and Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, and we have all of our information going out across those different platforms. As a final note, the continued impact of this program is a real testament efforts of our entire team. A big thank you as always to our tech manager, Peter Dory, and to our creative director, Ndondom Saga, who work behind the scenes to make the Resistance Bureau a success. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. Stay safe in the meantime. Keep fighting the good fight and see you next time. Goodbye.